straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. The arraignment of an Ohio man accused of murdering a young mother and throwing her three-year-old in a river while he was still alive. Why prosecutors are now seeking the death penalty. We kept the body of Naitisha in her apartment on Melrose until he disposed of her body at a later time. The legal arguments over whether ex-cop Derek Chauvin should face a third-degree murder charge in his upcoming trial. Our analysis of the George Floyd case. A former Florida mayor is agreeing to plead guilty to shooting at deputies executing a search warrant on his home. And the verdict in the no-body murder trial, what a Wisconsin jury decided after two days of deliberation. We, the jury, find the defendant, James M. Prokopovich, guilty. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. An Ohio man pleads not guilty to murdering his ex-girlfriend and killing her three-year-old son. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is here with new details from the felony arraignment for Deshaun Brown. Yeah, Brian, Deshaun Brown faces the possibility of the death penalty if convicted of the murders of Nitisha Lattimore and her son Nilo. And we're learning new details about the way that Nitisha died. Sheriff's deputies led Deshaun Brown into a courtroom in Cincinnati to answer to charges of aggravated murder and gross abuse of a corpse. Seeing Brown in person brought out emotions among Nitisha and Nilo Lattimore's family members. Um, right in the courtroom. Listen, folks, you will not speak out in this room like that. This is a court of law. If you can't maintain yourself, you're leave immediately. Go ahead out. A man was escorted out of the courtroom before prosecutors revealed gruesome details about Nitisha's death. He killed two people. He killed Nitisha Lattimore. That was premeditated. He stabbed her um, 11 times in the neck. Um, after he stabbed and killed her, he purposely killed Nilo Lattimore, who was three years old at the time. When announcing the indictment, Prosecutor Joe Dieters said Brown threw Nilo into the Ohio River alive shortly after killing Nitisha on December 5th. Dieters showed surveillance photos of Brown carrying something out of the apartment building. He said Brown kept her body in her apartment for six days before placing it in a body bag and taking the body to the Ohio River, leaving it near a bridge. Over the weekend, the Lattimore family and those who searched for Nilo's body released balloons in memory of the mother and son over the spot where prosecutors say Nilo was killed. The little boy's body has not been recovered. The court will set no bond. He'll be held um, without bond pending trial. Now, Deshaun Brown's lawyer had actually asked the judge to set a reasonable bail, but in the state of Ohio, when a defendant is charged with aggravated murder, murder with a death penalty specification, that defendant can be held without bail. Deshaun Brown will be back in court next month. Brian? Thanks, Anjanette. Joining us today is criminal defense attorney Julie Rendleman and Terry Austin. Julie, this is Brown's first appearance since it was announced that the death penalty was on the table and that he was being charged with the death of Nilo. What do you think the focus will be for the defense going forward? So I think, unfortunately, for the defense, they have an uphill battle. I think, you know, the first stage becomes how strong is the case against this defendant? Forget the death penalty for a second. How strong is the actual case? The second issue, it becomes the issue of the death penalty, because if the case is overwhelming in regards to the facts, overwhelming that he committed this crime, then the defense attorneys have several choices. One is they can try to push to try to get a plea deal uh, to avoid the death penalty and avoid the emotions and the length of trial. And then two, if they cannot do that, they're gonna try to figure out something that mitigates the horrific crimes. Is there a mental health issue? Perhaps there is because he stayed with the body six days. What normal person would do that? They're gonna look for something to try to show that there's some mitigation. I think it's gonna be incredible incredibly difficult, particularly when we're talking about this poor three-year-old that appears to have been put into the water while still alive. Um, but let's see what the defense counsel comes up with. Yeah, Terry, the plea deal is written all over this case, but because of that three-year-old, I don't know if they're going to get it. Talk to us about the death penalty here. The prosecution says they're seeking it because of the aggravating factors. Well, that's right, Brian, and the aggravating factor here in this case is the fact that 
Nilo was three years old, so he's under the age of 13. Ohio, as you know, has the death penalty, and aggravating factors include the fact that the individual was under the age of 13. And the prosecutor said that he's going to seek the death penalty no matter what. He's a proponent of the death penalty, and despite the fact that there is a current moratorium, and despite the fact that the death penalty might be repealed by the legislators. So either way, because it's the current law, the prosecutor has decided that he is going to seek the death penalty. Absolutely. And, and Jeanette, the prosecutor accused Deshaun Brown of using an Uber to take Nitisha's Lattimore's body to the bridge. What do we know about the driver? Yeah, uh, we know that the prosecution has said and the detectives have said that the Uber driver has been incredibly cooperative. A lot of people have had questions about how in the world you could take a body and place it in an Uber when it had been sitting for six days. You would think that obviously decomposition would have started by that time and that there would have been some odor, but um, we've been told that the driver of that Uber has been incredibly cooperative and that uh, Deshaun Brown had told that driver that he was moving out of the apartment and these were his belongings, some clothes and things like that. It's gonna be interesting testimony from that Uber driver. Thank you all. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, the verdict in the no-body murder trial out of Wisconsin. But first, will ex-Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin face a third charge in his upcoming trial for the murder of George Floyd? Our legal analysis after the break. Welcome back. The Minnesota Court of Appeals is now deciding if one of the murder charges against a former officer in the death of George Floyd should be reinstated. Derek Chauvin's trial for second-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter is scheduled to begin on March 8th. Chauvin's defense convinced the trial judge to drop the charge of third-degree murder. Since then, the appeals court upheld the same charge for former Minneapolis cop Muhammad Noor. Nor was convicted in the 2017 shooting of an Australian-American woman who called the police to report a possible assault. Prosecutors say Chauvin should face the same charge. Decided the question in one direction, the trial judge decided it in another. Without action from this court, a landmark criminal case, one of the most important in our nation's history, will take place with a major part of the case, third-degree murder, missing, nowhere in it whatsoever. That can't possibly be the law. A trial judge can't have a unilateral veto to block this court's decisions. In making matters worse, that error can never be fixed due to jeopardy. The harm here is asymmetric. If you rule for us, and later the Supreme Court reverses Noor, Mr. Chauvin will have ample opportunity to seek reversal of his conviction on appeal. But if you rule against us, we'll never be able to charge third-degree murder, ever. A trial judge shouldn't be able to do that. And second, the trial judge challenged the Noor decision, saying he sided with the dissent. And that's just wrong on the merits. The third degree murder statute doesn't require proof that the defendant's act was directed at more than one person. Noor, in effect, was right. Chauvin's defense argues the court's ruling is not binding precedent because of a possibility that it would be reviewed by the state Supreme Court. I think we all know as practitioners that if the Supreme Court does accept review in a criminal case, it's often a year or more before we get a decision. So Understood. although the rules limit the time in which the parties can seek review by the Supreme Court, if your position is the decision of this court is not final until an appellate judgment is issued and the Supreme Court does take review, I mean, that means people could be waiting, you know, 12 plus months for final judgment and this court's precedential opinion in the meantime would have no effect according to your position. Um, your Honor, I think that that's the rarity as opposed, that's the exception to the rule rather than the general rule. I would generally agree that yes, you could be potentially faced with a situation where a court of appeals issues a precedential opinion and that opinion does not take effect for 12 plus months, as the court points out. But it also ignores when the state says that there is no harm to a defendant, especially in the context of a criminal case. So you look at, you look at the context of a criminal case. Yes, my client would have the right to 
appeal that decision if nor were to be overturned, but he would have to do it from the confines of a prison cell. And that is volative of due process. My friend's rule could be the law in a criminal case is deeply dangerous. As I said, it has asymmetric harms to us. That's one of our most important points because this is our only chance today to reinstate that third degree murder charge. We can't fix it later on appeal. And it's astonishing to me what my friend just said to, to Judge Larkin in response. He said, well, the remedy for the state is in other cases, just not to charge homicides for a year or longer. Imagine the harm to the public, not just obviously in a case like this with the gravity it has, but in any case to say prosecutors have to wait a year or more to bring homicide charges that can't possibly be the law. All right, here to dive into the appellate arguments in the Derek Chauvin case is criminal defense attorney Julie Rendleman and Terry Austin. Terry, this is an uphill battle for Chauvin's attorneys. They have to convince the judge who decided former officer Mohammed Nora's case that a charge shouldn't be applied to Chauvin until a higher court than her reviews the case. How do you think that's going to play out? Brian, I watched this argument. There is no question in my mind that the state is going to prevail because the trial court is bound to apply the NOR decision as it currently stands. And as it stands today, the question in NOR was whether a third degree murder charge could apply if the defendant's homicidal act endangered an individual versus multiple people. The court said yes. So I think Judge Cahill is duty bound to follow the ruling law and he should grant the state's request to reinstate the third degree murder charge here as it you know, relates to Chauvin. Julie, I know you're a criminal defense attorney, but you're also a former prosecutor. The craziest argument, I think we just heard it there, was that from Chauvin's attorney, was that if prosecutors couldn't arrest people for murder charges of similar facts until the state Supreme Court ruled, that boggled my mind. What did you think of that argument or other arguments that were put forward? So, you know, keep in mind, I mean, it, it, this is a defense attorney who's doing his job. Um, I think he knows, I, I hope he knows, that it's an incredible uphill battle. He's aware that the murder three is probably the most damaging charge in regards to this case because it's the easiest to prove against his client. And so he's going to do his best to try to at least make some arguments um, before this court. Now, I think he's well aware that this is the court that made the original decision in Noor, and he's well aware that what he's relying on from the old cases is really dicta, which is not really um, binding. Um, and I think the court made it pretty clear, unless I think we'd all be shocked, um, that the court has already pretty much made up their mind that, that the murder three is coming back. Now, whether or not at a later date it can be appealed if he is convicted, that's a whole other issue. Um, but I believe it's going to get reinstated. I would agree, but either way this gets decided, it's going to have huge implications either for Chauvin's trial or the state of Minnesota. We're definitely going to come back and let you know when we get that decision. It's going to change how that Chauvin case begins and starts in a couple weeks. Thank you. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, a cold case solved thanks to a soda pop can. Plus, the former Florida mayor accused of shooting at police is taking a plea deal. All the details of the Dale Mossad case you need to know after the break. And now to check in on top legal stories making headlines at the Law & Crime Network. A former Florida mayor charged with attempted murder is taking a plea deal. Dale Mossad is accused of firing at Pasco County Sheriff's deputies who served him a search warrant last February. He's also charged with practicing medicine without a license. His trial was pushed back several times due to COVID-19 concerns. Prosecutors agreed to drop the highest charge in exchange for his guilty plea to aggravated assault. He's scheduled to officially enter his guilty plea later this week. We are waiving the three-year minimum mandatory for an aggravated assault law enforcement officer, and the plea will be to three years in the Department of Corrections, uh, concurrent on counts one, six, and seven. Six and seven are going to be as charged. And are you in agreement with entering a plea as it relates to that? Yes. A restitution hearing has been set in the Iowa case of a man convicted of murdering a teen at a mall in 1979. Jerry Burns was found guilty last year of killing 18-year-old Michelle Martinko. 
The case was a cold case for decades until investigators used genetic genealogy to match DNA from a straw Burns had discarded to DNA found at the crime scene. Burns is currently serving a life sentence in a state prison. Now up for debate is if the defendant owes the victim's family $150,000. Prosecutors say they wish to cross-examine the defendant about his financial affidavit on March 15th. Authorities in Colorado have announced the arrest for a suspect in another cold case. David Anderson is accused of murdering Sylvia Quayle in 1981. Sherry Hills Village police say Quayle was shot in the head, stabbed three times, strangled, and sexually assaulted. An unknown male DNA sample was developed in 2000. Last year, investigators used genetic genealogy to identify a potential suspect. Detectives collected a Coke can from Anderson's trash and say they got a match. Her father found her in the condition that I know she was in, the way that she was left after being brutalized and killed. I can't imagine, as a father myself, of a young woman about this age, to have a morning like that. And I know he's not here, and for me, that's part of the hardest part of solving these 40-year-old cases, and we've solved quite a few of them now, is that some of the people that want answers, that need closure, they don't get it, because they're gone. When we come back, the verdict and what happened after in the no-body murder trial that left us all shocked. Next. As to the offense of first-degree intentional homicide, we, the jury, find the defendant, James M. Prokopovitz, the verdict has been marked guilty. Guilty on all counts. A Wisconsin jury found that a husband did murder his wife and hit her body. So how did we get here? Victoria Prokopovich was reported missing in 2013. Friends, family, and local groups began searching for her. I went out into the woods where we searched. I heard him say, you guys are wasting your time. She's nowhere around here, and you will never find her. He was sitting in the kitchen at the table, and he's like, I don't know what we're going to do with all of her. Look at all this stuff. This place is too big for two people. It's comments like those that made investigators suspicious of the victim's husband, James Prokopovich. But Victoria has never been found, and so the case remained open. If you guys think I did something, God damn it, arrest me and haul me in. Authorities did just that in 2019. Prokopovich admitted to lying to police about meeting his new girlfriend, Catherine Friday. Friday was also arrested for perjury. She died last year before sentencing. Prosecutors say they believe the defendant disposed of the victim's body in a sludge pond. But the defense maintained she suffered from mental illness and was suicidal. She said in 2003, next time I do it, no one's going to find me. She meant it. She left. We don't know where she is. We don't know if she's living somewhere else. We don't know if she's alive or dead. Then, it was up to the jury. After more than 22 hours of deliberation, over two days, they returned their verdict. In the state of Wisconsin versus James M. Prokopovitz, as to the offense of first-degree intentional homicide, the verdict has been marked guilty. As to the offense of obstructing an officer, it has been marked guilty. As to the offense of conspiracy to commit perjury before court, guilty. As to the offense of perjury before court, guilty. Counsel, we request polling of the jurors. We are not. No, Your Honor. Motions on the verdict? At this time, the state is moving for the court to accept the jury verdict. Defense position? Your Honor, uh, we understood the lengthy deliberations and will accept the jurors' decision in this case. Based upon the jury verdict, there is no longer a presumption of innocence consistent with the jury verdict and the extensive exposure that this defendant faces, we are asking that the court revoke bond at this time. Defense argument? Your Honor, he already had a, a very high cash bond, so understanding the nature of the case, the verdict of the jury, um, there is no opposition. Court will grant the motion. Uh, bond will be revoked. Defendant will be held without bond pending sentencing. The defendant is scheduled to be sentenced on April 30th.
he faces up to life in prison. Here to break down the verdict of James Prokopovich is Julie Rendleman and Terry Austin. Julie, was this the verdict you expected? Why or why not? So I was, I was always wrong, but I, I did not think that they had uh, proven this case beyond a reasonable doubt. I, I was obviously felt that there was enough for the perjury charges. Um, I thought the evidence was there. I thought it was enough for the obstruction charges. But I believe, based just on that statement from the from the victim, i.e., that you will never find me the next time, i.e., the next time I try to commit suicide, that to me was the reasonable doubt that the defense needed. So I admit that I was a bit surprised by the verdict. Yeah, I was betting on a hung jury the whole time. Terry, this was not the result you expected, I know that, but you also had some thoughts about how the defense handled the case after the verdict. Care to share? Well, Brian, I was surprised that the verdict came back the way it did because I think the defense did a great job at raising reasonable doubt. But I was shocked that the defense did not make any motions after the verdict, and he didn't poll the jury, and he didn't ask about the bond. He just agreed to everything. And so it's a little bit surprising that the defense worked so hard throughout the trial that he raised such great reasonable doubt but after the verdict, he just sat back. And I think what might have happened is they had a discussion, the defendant and the attorney, and they must have decided that when the verdict comes back, if it comes back guilty, we'll just accept it. So maybe yeah. he was guilty. And polling the jury is not that uncommon when the defense lose. Polling the jury, you say, hey, judge, I want each and every juror to let me know what their verdict is. That's not that rare, right, Julie? No, in fact, it, it's not uncommon for one or two jurors to say, uh, you know what, I'm not positive that that's my decision. And how could you not ask? Um, exactly. And Terry's absolutely right. Thanks for joining us here at Long Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.